Today we answer the question, the all-important question, what must I do to be saved? Valentine's Day is coming up. We know it because we see all the decorations in the stores, we see all the promotions on the commercials on TV, we see the Hallmark Channel pulling out all the specials. We know Valentine's Day is coming. Jewelry stores are throwing all the ads they can think of on TV and in the newspaper. So there's no doubt Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and so everybody's thinking about love. But have you thought about the greatest love? The greatest love ever, that ever was, that ever will be. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you're, maybe you're searching for God. Maybe you thought you might be saved, but you're not sure. Maybe you're coming to the point where you saw the title on this video, and you said to yourself, I want to know, what must I do to be saved? What question could be more important to us? It addresses where we will all spend eternity after our life in this world is over. And you might have an idea Maybe you have a friend who's been asking you, or loved ones, or maybe you yourself want to know, what must I do to be saved? You've maybe heard it preached a little bit here and there, maybe saw a video, heard a song, read a tract. But the Bible is very clear on how a person can be saved. There was a man keeping Paul and Silas in jail, and he asked him that very question. What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas answer him, in Acts 16.31, they say, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But that's such a simple answer. Is there more to it than that? I mean, it's great. It's great. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. That's great. But what does that mean? How can you be saved? What do you need to do to be saved? You see, we've all sinned and fallen short of God. We are all sinners. That's made very clear in Romans 3.23. And it's also made clear in Psalm 51.5 that we were born with sin. Because it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And we've all made the choice to sin. We've all chosen with our free will to choose to sin, to do the wrong thing, to do what we know we not ought to do. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us at least be honest with ourselves and say that we are sinners, that we have chosen to do the wrong thing. Let's at least be honest with ourselves and say that we've all done that at some point in time. Lied, stolen, cheated, committed adultery. Maybe, maybe, uh, who knows what else you've done. But we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now while all physical consequences of sin is a physical death, that's not the only kind of death that results from sin. See, sin is ultimately committed against an eternal, holy, infinite God. And because of that, the just penalty for our sin is also eternal and infinite. What we need to be saved from is an eternal punishment. Revelation 20.15 says, And if anyone's name was not found and written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So, can I be saved? Can anyone be saved? Did God provide a way for us to be saved? To have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, even though we have willfully chosen to sin and do what we know we shouldn't? Yes, yes, God made a way. And here's the beautiful thing. Just because the penalty for sin is infinite and eternal, only God could pay the penalty. And because it needed a perfect sacrifice, somebody who lived a perfect life, that's something none of us could do. So God himself did what we ourselves could not. Because only he is infinite and eternal, and only he is perfect. So God in his divine nature, he cannot die. So God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, so that God could take on human flesh and live among us and teach us. And when the people rejected him and his message and sought to kill him, he willingly sacrificed himself for us, allowing himself to be crucified, allowing himself to be the sacrifice 
to pay the price that we could not pay. John 10.15 says that he lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. And because Jesus Christ was human, he could die. And because Jesus Christ was God, his death had an eternal and infinite value. And, and he was able to live a righteous, perfect life that none of us humans could do. And therefore, Jesus' death on the cross was the perfect and complete one-time payment for our sin. 1 John 2.2 2 says that he is the he is the propitiation for our sin and not for ours only but also for the sins of the world he is the payment for our sin he took the punishment that we deserved Jesus's resurrection from the dead also demonstrated that his death was indeed perfectly sufficient and an acceptable sacrifice to God so you're hearing this and it's all making sense what is it that you need to do well, Acts 16.31, again, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But there's more to it than that, not just believing in the Lord Jesus. Even the demons who Jesus cast out of the man and sent into a, a, a pack of pigs believed that Jesus was and that Jesus was the, the Son of God. So even they believed in Jesus. You need to do more than that. You need to repent and believe. Luke 13.3 says, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So you must fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins, believing in him, so you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. Jesus is the way of salvation. Ephesians 2.8-9 is beautiful. Listen to what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast there's nothing you can do to earn God's salvation it's a gift of God by having faith in Jesus Christ so when you have faith in Jesus Christ it causes you to repent to change your mind and to change your ways to begin to live God's way instead of your way. If I repent and believe, then what does it mean to follow Jesus? Right? This is the this is the follow-up question that usually gets missed. Because we're so anxious to when somebody's interested in, in being saved and accepting Christ, we're so interested in, in just saying, Oh, pray this prayer with me and oh now you're saved, but we never follow up and tell people what it means to follow Jesus. In Matthew 10, verses 34 through 39, Jesus says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whosoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now, Jesus bringing a sword and turning family members against each other can seem really harsh after words like, Whosoever believes on him will not perish, but have eternal life. And hearing about God's love. It, it, can, it can be hard to hear those words and very confusing. But Jesus never softened the truth. And the truth is, is that following Jesus leads to difficult choices. And sometimes when you decide to follow Jesus, sometimes you're going to have a desire to turn back. Sometimes turning back may seem very appealing. When Jesus is teaching, uh, as he's teaching the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, and he's talking about coming to the cross, many who had followed him turned away. Even, even the disciples decided that following Jesus was too difficult the night that he was arrested. Every one of them deserted him. And on that night, following Christ meant possible arrest and execution. I mean, even Peter, rather than risk his own life, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. 
To truly follow Christ means that he has become everything to us. Everyone follows something. Friends, culture, family, our own selfish desires, or God. We can only choose to follow one thing at a time. Matthew 6.24 talks about how no one can serve two masters. Well, God states that we are to have no other gods before him. Exodus 23, Deuteronomy 5.7 To truly follow Christ means that we do not follow anything else. Jesus tells us in Luke 9.23, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. There's no such thing as a halfway disciple. As the disciples demonstrated, nobody can follow Christ by the strength of his or her own willpower. When they tried to follow Christ in their own willpower, they failed. They all abandoned him. Peter lied about even knowing him. In their own power, they weren't able to do it. None of us are. And the Pharisees were good examples of those who were trying to obey God in their own strength, too. Their, their self-effort only led to arrogance and distortion of the whole purpose of God's law and, and word. Jesus gave his disciples the secret to faithfully following him. But at the time, they didn't understand it. They didn't recognize it. Jesus said to them, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. He said that in John 6, verse 63. The Spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. And in verse 65 he says, And this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. You see, the disciples had walked with Jesus for three years, observing him, learning from him, participating in his miracles. Yet even they could not follow him faithfully in their own strength. They needed a helper. Jesus promised many times that once he ascended to the Father that he would send a helper to them. And that's the Holy Spirit. In fact, he told them that it was for their good that he was going away so that the Holy Spirit could come. So you see, the apostles, they believed in Jesus. They decided that they wanted to follow him. And that's the point I'm making. If you make the decision to believe in Jesus and to follow him, that's, that's great. That's the first step. But you won't be able to do it successfully in your own strength. Just like how the apostles couldn't do it successfully in their own strength. They needed a helper. The Holy Spirit indwells the heart of every believer. That's all over in Scripture. Romans 8.16, Hebrews 13.5, Galatians 2.20. Jesus warned his followers that they were not to begin testifying of him until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's referring to the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came upon those first believers at Pentecost, they suddenly had all the power they needed to follow Christ, even to death, if necessary. Following Jesus means striving to be like him. Jesus always obeyed God the Father. So that's what we strive to do. To truly follow Christ means to make him sovereign, to make him our Lord. He is in our authority over all. Not only over all the heavens and earth, but over all of our life, our, our past, our present, our future, our dreams, our expectations, the results of the things that we're working on. God is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign of them all. Every dream, every decision is filtered through his word with the goal of glorifying him in everything. We're not saved by the things that we do for Christ but by what Christ has done for us. And because of his grace, we want to please him in everything. All this is accomplished as we allow God, through the Holy Spirit that we talked about, to have complete control of every area of our lives, to make him sovereign over every area of our lives. The Holy Spirit explains scriptures to us, empowers us with spiritual gifts, comforts us, guides us, gives us courage, to follow Christ means we apply the truths we learn from his word and live as if Jesus was walking right beside us in person. I encourage you, if, if, if you in faith have believed and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, or if you're thinking about it, 
or perhaps you still have questions. Either way, please contact us. We would love to hear from you and help you. You can find uh, ways to contact us on our website, which is www.wingsandprayer.org. That's wingsandprayer.org. Or you can comment, uh, you know, here through the, the YouTube. But we'd love to hear from you and help you. And we just pray that God will move in your lives and he will open your hearts and your spirits. And that uh, if he's knocking on your heart today, we pray that uh, you'll open the door to him. God's peace be with you and God bless you.